I'm here with Jamie Hutchings and Ben Grounds from Blue Bottle Kiss. First question for you. Why did this lineup of Blue Bottle Kiss get back together and do these shows? It's a good question. <laughs> I think, well, for me, it felt like a purple patch because this is the lineup I joined when I joined in 2001 or two. And it was, it was a pretty good time for the band, in, not in song and artistry, but in commercial positioning, Triple J play, playing festivals, getting good crowds. Yeah. So it did feel like a, a, a an era of the band that felt like it was, um, to me it was, well, to me it was new and fun, so. Yeah, I think also we were reissuing Patient. I can't remember mm. if that came before the idea of playing together or not, but I know that um, Fletcher especially, like, I think, I guess, say, if I'd been adamant that it was just Richo, Fletcher and me playing as a three-piece, maybe Fletch would have done it like that. But he, I mean, he was really one of the people that was really keen for this to happen and he always wanted it to be, you know, Richo, Groundsy and me. So that was kind of part of it too. That was, he was sort of quite insistent about it being that lineup because that's when he moved to guitar, mm. um, which was his preference as well. So I'd say that probably had something to do with, it, do with it, even though Patient was technically Richo, Fletcher and me, just the three of us. We did, when Groundsy joined, we did like learn a lot of those mm. those songs and just sort of rearrange them to suit a quartet rather than a trio, which was pretty easy to do. I think a lot of the, I get stuck thinking about what the fans think and want and what it feels like to be in the band. Like, so I think to me, Patient felt like a bit of a breakthrough in the bands. I was still a big fan then, breakthrough in the bands kind of um, album making, maybe. Yeah. Um, and Revenge felt like the bit of a breakthrough more commercially. But I think in the end, when you think about this stuff as middle aged guys, it's like, what's what was fun? It's, you know, you can't extrapolate your experience and your memories and your joy from the different eras. Mm. And for me, all the eras were great, but that was, I don't know, it just felt like a good era. It just felt like a good lineup of the band and fun to play in. Yeah. Yeah, I think we had um, Richard and Fletch and me have been playing together for a mm, really long time mm -hmm. by that by that stage. And mm. I, when Fletch wanted to move to guitar after we came back from America, I was like, oh, I don't know how this will work, but was was up for it. And then it sort of turned into a completely different thing. So it felt it felt weird to go backward to go back mm, from there. Felt mm. kind of a bit regressive, I guess. Two guitars is more flexible than one. Fletch's vocals and great yeah the yeah the time yeah which is drumming like everyone loves richo's drumming yeah 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 i mean richo as a drummer that was a pretty special period mm. having him play drums mm. rock and roll is a young man's game <laughs> discuss i mean rock and roll's dead now isn't it i don't know I, genres have kind of disappeared I, I struggle figuring out what it all means i was worried with with the reunion tour that it was we were completely irrelevant like who wants to wants to watch four white guys on stage these days but it turns out I think I think there's still power in it especially for the people that grew up listening to it um, I was the three of them up in Sydney I'm down in Victoria three of them um, rehearsed a bit and I was like oh how's it going I don't I really don't want this to be a lame slower less energy kind of yeah. I didn't want to you know ruin what it was by coming back and it being worse Mm. But we had two rehearsals, literally had two rehearsals before the tour. And it did, there was the, it's such a cliche, but the, the chemistry was there, you know, it was still. And so per, I think personally I was like, okay, this is, I, I feel as into this as I was ever. And actually almost like we're playing better than when we were a young, young band. Yeah. So, and we were like, there was still, we weren't just standing there like feet glued to the floor, not, not moving, it felt. And it, so my experience playing rock and roll as a not a young man anymore was like this is still great. Yeah, just two rehearsals. Oh no, we, I think I had two. You you had a few more. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Richo and I actually, Richo had said he wanted to get kind of drum fit again because he hadn't played drums for years. So even pre-COVID, he was like we were just vaguely talking about it, and Fletch was still living 
overseas. I think he was in America at that stage. So he was talking to us about it and Richo was like, can you and I just, and I hadn't spoken to Richo for years, but he was like, can you and I just, do you mind just getting together with me and just us playing a bit, you know? So it sort of starts. So we were, we did sort of build up to it and then COVID hit. And then, but by the time Groundsy came, it was like the three of us, Fletch, me and Richo have been playing with just two guitars and drums, which is weird for the Blue Bottle stuff. It really needs the bass, but we were pretty we'd kind of worked out all the, you know, like remembering mm. all the parts and Groundy just came in and it was like, bang, it's really, really easy. But like going back to your question about whether it's a young man's game, yeah, I um, I feel like, like Groundy's saying, I think when, you, when, you've, when you're playing uh, rock music older, in a, in a sense, um, you appreciate it, it, it more because you maybe take it for granted more when you're, when you're younger and also you've accumulated so much um your your ears have soaked up so much so many different types of music over those decades that you're just drawing from so many different approaches and you don't have that experience as a young person so i think it's a lot to be said for um for older rock and roll i mean unfortunately you do hear stuff i mean i i'll go and listen to a band they're early music and then they've reformed and made a new album and some bands that do that they just it's awful you know it's like this kind of you know Mark Knopfler sort of style guitar playing where earlier on it was really wild and free but then you hear bands like say Swans or you know Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds or this or I remember Hot Snakes when they were around like bands of guys have been playing music for a long time and then they're they're in their 40s 50s 60s and some of them because they've they're, they're explorers they're drawing from places that that take you know 40 years worth of listening to use um so yeah there's definitely something to be said for the like the energy that kind of unabashed energy and and also that earnest intent that comes with with young with with a young person making music but yeah it's just an extra layer of kind of listening and and um exploratory think, thinking that comes with with some older bands some it's as i said it's it can be quite tragic as well where they're trying to um win people over or they feel like they're trying to play in a more professional or smoother way or that there's that kind of thing that happens but yeah not or, always or an attempt to recapture something and i feel like it's also about what does what does the music suit and what suits the band and in this case i feel like blue bottle kiss suit being middle-aged as well there's there's something really beautiful and gnarled about the music and it just there's aspects of it that i felt like worked worked more and worked more deeply it was you know a few of us thought there's something kind of spiritual happening on stage Mm. I think maybe there's an, there's a sense of joy that's that was there. One, I think one of the things that we enjoyed most about the tour was just hanging out. There was a lot of, I mean, it was always there was always lots of great stuff about us being together before, but there's a lot of pressures and from our external sources and also young people thinking about oh how long can I keep doing this? I've got to work out what I'm doing in my life, all that kind of thing. And where everyone's gone away and they've got you know different members of the band have families and they're everyone is it's independent and is able to function as a human being these days outside of music so everyone just turned up and there was a real joy everyone just uh actually loved hanging out with each other and um yeah there was just a real juicy sort of joy <laughs> sort of in the middle of it all and that kind of thing of like oh well, you know how are we going to pull this off or we've got it what are we going to do next you know because otherwise this booking agency is going to drop us or you know all that sort of stuff is irrelevant so i think that is a good influence i think the passing of time can add color and can really intensify things rather than diluting things particularly for this band so what do you think time brought to blue bottle kiss for these shows But uh, I'm just thinking. It's it's. Um, I mean, the the first answer is I don't really have a conscious understanding. You know, it's. I think um, the Jamie's songs were always more complex and gnarled, as you say, than the 
you know, the average indie indie rock of the late nineties and early noughties. And, so, and I think if we'd gotten together and learnt the song, relearnt the songs and thought, oh, they don't stand up that well, you know, they've aged badly, but they didn't. They aged great. Um, and I think a bit like you were saying, Jamie, you, you end up life seems so meaningful when you're young, but then as you get older, life is meaningful. You actually have more meaningful life experiences, and uh, they're deeper and they mean more. And the, but you get better at dealing with it, and you you understand what's important in life and the, the social connections. And I think a lot of people, and certainly for me, before I joined the band, I was a fan, and then after I joined, that that kind of stuff is a soundtrack to your life. The the right music is a soundtrack to your life, and that's a lot of Jamie's songs and the the diversity of quiet little sad songs and explosive like it's it's just a to me it's a it's a great soundtrack to life um and i think that's where it'll blue bottle kisses music will kind of will remain relevant and not age poorly um compared to something like I, I sometimes i pull out an old cd that i used to i just loved you know when i was 21 and listen to it now i think oh you know that's it's all of its time it's of my time you know that's the past but uh, and you draw a line, listen to Jamie's new album, solo album. You, you just, it's, a, it's a style of songwriting. It's, it's got the bittersweet, kind of happy, sad. It, there's just a l- line of um, feeling or emotion that was there with Blue Bottle songs. And it, that'll, to me, that still works. You talked before about... Uh, I got the impression that one thing that might have been surprising was how easily it gelled again. What else was surprising for you about the process of getting back together and doing this, especially after 20 years? Hmm. Um, I think that was the biggest surprise. I didn't think it would be, well. I haven't I, seen Ben or Richard for 15 or 20 yeah, years. Wow. Like, it was kind of, I felt like I was a different person in my 20s and touring in a rock band you know it's it's a particular coming of age kind of story and i was like i wonder what it's going to be like running you know in a room touring with these people that i've haven't what life's happened you know i'm, I'm a completely different person it feels like what are the, so it's it kind of a nice surprise that actually the chemistry of playing music but also the social yeah connectedness it's just really like it was, yeah i think um you spend enough time sharing in a van and sharing beds to well, like, Fle- like Fletcher was like 15 or 16 when he joined the band. And he was just always really young. And I don't know, there was times when him and I just wanted to throttle each other, you know. <laughs> um, so to be with him, like just something like, I mean, I don't know, it's not a surprise, but like hanging out with Fletcher and him just like turning up into the, walking into the room and setting up his pedal, pedal board immaculately, you know, like, really really together very very technically kind of together got all that stuff really professional and he's because he's been sort of uh playing as a side man to various um artists for years and he's just very together um you know and even just like working out guitar it's okay so it's like this is it's like uh, this i mean him and i have actually stayed in touch like always um and there's always been a lot of affection between us we're like brothers i suppose because our formative years were spent side by side you know for better or for, for, for worse but um yeah it's just interesting even just something like that that you're like 20 years later just the development in 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 people how they've how they've mm. kind of changed i mean richard was always pretty together like so he doesn't seem that, that different that that different but um but the, yeah the joy for me was quite a surprise because i think i was probably in my head subconsciously i was thinking well last time we did this we were booking ourselves. We were managing ourselves. The, the art, the being in a band was actually ninety percent painful business Work. stuff. Yeah, ninety percent not yeah. playing music. And this time, like you were saying earlier, Jamie, it's just it was actually the pressure off from ourselves and everyone else was off. We're not we're not trying to get a record deal or make it. We're just like just yeah. getting back together to have fun. It was it was really joyous. I didn't expect it to be so so much fun. I was thinking then, aside from the fact that I'd. I'd love for Flesh to have a writer apply to some, <laughs> some of that stuff right now because um, he's, he's excellent value as well. Uh, but there's there's a maybe a difference is there's a ruthlessness to, to young men and there's a ruthlessness to the industry that you're trying to make headway in now. Mm. 
you're free of that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of that's collapsed, but um, personally, I was very uncomfortable. Like, in you know, we first started getting interest when, when I was 21 or 22, and um, the kind of people I would meet that would, I'd have conversations with from the music industry, most of them were found really intimidating. Like, it was just... They were a different species of people. I was a person writing songs in my bedroom. You know, I wasn't some kind of like, you know, streetwise kind of tough kind of guy, you know, with sort of, you know, just that's, you know, not that, that world weary kind of cynical, hedonistic sort of type of person which seemed to inhabit the music industry back then. It was like, it was kind of uncomfortable. So, we, and so I guess because I was leading the band, I felt like such an, out, out, outsider in that kind of world. Um, so it was really, it was a really hard world to navigate. Um, and you really did have to, and it held back Blue Bottle a lot is because unless you inhabited that world fully, then your opportunities would be very minimized. And, and um, yeah, Blue Bottle was never really in that, in that world. We're always on the peripheries of it, you know. You still know people and whatever, but it's never like, Sensitivity and introversion weren't a key part of yeah. late 90s no. masculine music culture. No, no, it was re- yeah, really, really ruthless. And, you know, it wasn't like you couldn't get out of things by sending an email to someone. You had to call, call people up and talk to people on the phone and they'd just be like really offhand and really like, uh, yeah. And then suddenly you'd be the greatest thing in the world and everyone would be like, you know, being thinking that you're really cool and sort of, and it would, it would all flip and you'd be like, oh, well, I'm still the same guy. Like, you know, just a very confusing experience to go through as I'm sure it is for every young person that starts out just make, mucking, mucking around on guitar in their bedroom and next thing they're kind of navigating that world so yeah with this we just sort of could turn up and play and the audience would turn up and watch it was very simple. It was a good thing though I think if we'd sold three pre-sale tickets for each show I would have been more like oh what are, we, what are we doing this again but people turned up like there was still a lot of people that really wanted to see us loved it they were great shows yeah. So it was kind of the freedom I think came because there were still fans that would come and see us and we weren't trying to make it into anything. We were just playing some shows. If we say that Blue Bottle Kiss are a band that are greater than the sum of its parts and we're looking at the lineup of Hutchings, Fletcher, Grounds and Caneliano, what is it that these guys bring to Jamie's songs that make them into Blue Bottle Kiss songs? I think I think every lineup of the band had um, certain things about it that were idiosyncratic and really special. Um, even when I think of, say, Peter, um, who played drums on a lot of the Murmur stuff, like he was an extremely hard-hitting, powerful drummer and also really a bit of a Keith Moon, so kind of hard to contain, kind of undisciplined in a way, but then also like great when it came to some of the really jammy songs, like, you know, so, so the Fletch... Peter Noble and me lineup had a certain freewheeling kind of thing that when it was great it was really amazing and when it was bad it was a bit of a shambles and I could then describe each lineup as having its sort of pluses and 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 minuses I mean I think this lineup what made it more I think what made it more appealing to the public was completely accidental but it was I guess my style of guitar playing against Fletcher's, like basically a good example is a band, I feel like Blue Bottle became a bit like a band like the Straight Jacket Fits where um, you've got almost a sweet and sour sort of thing going on with both the guitar, two guitars and the vocalists and Fletch is really good at creating these really beautiful layers and atmospheres and also these ethereal angelic sort of vocals um and my kind of uh approach can be um a lot uh, uglier at times like it's i mean yeah it's more it's more jagged and brutal at times and so um there's that chemistry between us and then when richard joined on drums i mean he's he's a amazing combination of um chops like he he really knows how to play but he's not some studio cat he loves he's he's the songs man he's very much the songs come first so he's and he's a very emotive um he's a very emotive player you can see that in when just his sort of uh 
body language when he plays, you know, he has that almost Latin kind of like, uh, you know, he's Italian, so he's got that real kind of like he's got, he, he gets really involved in, in, in the music. And then Groundsy, who's originally when he joined, when Groundsy joined the band, he was a guitar player. He hadn't really played the bass, but like um, very, very musical. So it's like you don't have to tell Groundsy what to play at all. And um, I don't know, when you've got a bass player that just plays in such a, a muscular kind of and rhythmic and intuitive way it's almost you almost forget that you're playing guitar because it's just, just this kind of Mack truck going through that you know that the end of the song is gonna you're gonna make it to the end no matter what it's not like you're second guessing what the other person is gonna play so we've kind of got a, a muscular but intuitive rhythm section and then a sweet and sour kind of thing going on with the two guitar players singers so the best and most convoluted explanation I can give of the lineup, but that's I think what makes it work. And none of that was pre thought out. It's because the way that Fletch, Richo, and I played, it was very different. When it cha- when Fletch moved to guitar, yeah, it really changed the whole way the band sounded. And I even adjusted my guitar playing because I had a very big, thick sound before then because I was filling up a lot of space. And then I almost dialed back so I could create some space for Fletcher's guitar like to have that more we never wanted to be like a two guitar band where everyone's just you know playing exactly the same thing just riffing out it was like those sort of different textures sort of hitting off each other that was a big part of what the, happened. the the three of you before i joined was the th- was the f- most there was a lot of um life experience in that you'd, you'd been through so much as a yeah. three piece so you were playing like really I remember seeing you as a three piece a couple of times and it was it was hand in glove kind of stuff yeah and I was really conscious when I came in on bass I think because I hadn't played bass in a band I was trying to think I was thinking about how a bass should be and I was really conscious that there wasn't there wasn't a lot of room to, to be a bit flowery and yeah, Paul McCartney yeah. or whatever that wasn't the job it was really Blue Bottle was about the guitars so it was yeah. just like creating that really solid Thing underneath I think another thing it's probably true of all the lineups but it really I was it really struck me that the band was that the, the members of the band loved the music like they had the connection to the music like a fan would it wasn't like oh this is some cool band I'm just playing in it like they were really into it and I think I, I can't play I can't play like a plain blue little kiss in a band that I'm not I'm just kind of ho-hum about it you know there's a there's there's times when you're on stage and you hit a note or the part of the song that explodes, you, you're into it. You're not just playing the note. You you know, you're feeling it yourself. And I think that was really obvious to, to join a band like that. I think that kind of creates that chemistry in a way. Yeah. It's very, yeah. I was very lucky as a songwriter to have that. I mean, it, took, it takes years to get to that point where you're playing with people who are not only great musicians, but they're fans of the music. And even no matter what's happening in the kind of relationships between the members, um, there's still that belief in the songs, which if you're the person writing the songs, it's a pretty beautiful thing to know that everybody is kind of involved in the songs at the same time, almost in a way that's separate to mm. to you. They could hate your guts at the time, mm. but they still love the songs. Mm. Not that that was ever that bad, but that's a pretty... If you can get to that point in a band, that's pretty special. What happens on stage between the four of you? maybe not I don't know not that much I, I feel like I'm in some zone where I'm not consciously connecting I'm not kind of searching for a connection on stage I feel like I'm transported to some some other universe <laughs> I think that's what you mean when you talk about it being a spiritual, spiritual thing. Is I think there's a euphoric, there's a euphoric element where you're tapping into something outside of your outside of consciousness. I 
like say even the crowbar show I was surprised how good it sounded because I can't remember much of it you know like it was just it was so hot and so good There is a bit of a thing where you sort of can almost be having, not the whole time, but like there's times when you're really nailed to the ground, even when you're talking and stuff and you're mm. joking with each other, whatever, and it's very grounded. But there's other times where there is that um, euphoric element where you're, where you're, that's why people play music. And it's the reason why people do stupid things like take loads of drugs or whatever as well. It's just because they, they want to sort of go into some, some other stratosphere, you know, to, to, to basically transcend just normal everyday conscious existence um, but music is a is a kind of healthy way where you can kind of where you do that where you're not really aware of what's happening anymore and you're kind of levitating in a way so I think that the four of us um, you know we could all be sitting in the car and not, and not know what to talk about or you know like we may but it's like oh there's this thing that happens between four people and you don't even know what it is I think there's some of that joy like we, back in the day, we used to rehearse hard. Like we rehearsed a lot. Yeah. And it would help because when you're on stage, you could kind of go into autopilot. And it even felt like that this time, even though we hardly, re well, I felt like we hardly rehearsed. I think there's a lot of muscle memory and chemistry and whatever that on stage, there's, there's very few moments where I'm consciously going, I've got to look at someone or figure out what's, we've got to figure out, I've got to use my intellectual brain to figure out what's going on next. It's like, I'm just, yeah. you're in the flow, you know? 90% of my time on stage is in the flow and 10% is kind of trying to find the set list or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's quite amazing. That was actually, again, something that's really pleasurable is just sort of not thinking about everybody just seemed to just be in that place that Grounds is describing. <laughs> goes through you and, and your mind when you're just really, you're in it, if you can even recapture that in your thinking now, Jane? It is really, um, at times, really, I don't know, it's a place you can be completely unhinged, you know? You have, not that I consciously think about needing permission or anything, but it's a place that you can be completely un, 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 untethered, not that I'm sort of, you know, my shirt off and cutting myself up on stage like a hip hop or anything but you just sort of feel like you're um yeah there's it's a really i mean it's a real privilege actually because i'm sure that most people would benefit from being I, I think people people do it by dancing and um surfing big waves or there's just certain experiences where yeah where you I think of it, say, with surfing, and Grounds would relate, relate, relate to this as well, is, is like, if you're surfing bigger waves, for instance, um, you cannot be sort of taking off in a big wave and thinking, oh, what, what time's that job on Monday? You know, like, you kind of like, every single part of your body is just, like, your brain is totally switched off and something else is taking over. And music is like that, but it's more emotion. It's way more emotional. There's this other, more cathartic element that's sort of kicking in, as, as well. And it feels really, it feels kind of important. It feels when you're doing it, it feels like the most important thing you can be doing, which can sound seem pompous or whatever. But it just feels really enriching. Um, it sounds like the shows may have transcended the time and place in which you wrote those songs because it yeah because it's a personal thing writing and it can be a painful thing going back to stuff that you wrote you know 20 yeah years ago yeah 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 it's true i mean uh i was talking to this to, to fenton about this but when i was getting ready to do it and he goes he was like it's because it, it, what did he describe it as it's like a circus of the mind or it's like a it's like a like you, it is kind of to a degree in some ways a bit like you you are watching a film of different parts of the the of your of your life as well. There are certain things, but the greatest thing about it is that it's completely 
abstract. I'm not thinking about the meaning of each lyric when I'm singing it. It's actually quite primal. And there's things where you can be singing about something that isn't relevant to you anymore at all, but the intent is and the, the core kind of emotion you still really connect with. So, yeah, there's so many elements to it which are completely intangible and they always have been and they always will be. So it's really hard to kind of specifically describe what's going on. But um, it's not dissimilar to me. It's not dissimilar to being late teens, early 20s, all that period of your life and everything feels so meaningful and yet and you've got some music cranked and you just it, it kind of you want to jump or you want to do something that's, that's the music is hitting you so hard mm. and playing blue, with blue on stage still you, you get this extra benefit I, going back to the rock question like I don't know what I would have done if I didn't know the feeling of an amplifier pushing out sound waves so you the volume that you know you can feel your body vibrating to it and you can feel your pants slapping like there's something about that you combine that with music that you love so much and, and actually for the two of it people were singing the lit you know you've got this extra element where the, these other people are in the room experiencing they're singing the lyrics back to you and it's kind of it's such an elevating experience i'm getting goosebumps just talking about it <laughs> yeah it's very it is very privileged yeah it is i'm going to adjust this one now <laughs> sorry too many it's the thing with lapel mics too many um grand gestures As a prelude to the next question, just there's a couple of photographs there for you both to. Well, did you know these were coming, Jamie? Take yeah. a look at. <laughs> this oh, is your life. Safe photos. I haven't got pants on. <laughs> no, no, well, no. I've never seen these photos before. They were taken by but um, old friend Tara Schindler. What guitar are you playing there? PSG. I think that might be um, like a Epiphone mm. Les Paul mm. um, that. I had on permanent loan. Oh. Yeah, I, I I think I only ever used it for you for you're going to be on your own soon. I used to play it because the whole guitar was tuned down, mm -hmm. one tone, and it's got that classic sort of sound for that song. Mm. So I think I must have been playing that. So where's that? Where are these taken, Ben? At, uh, in Adelaide, probably at like the Glenelg Surf Clubs. Uh, like that, the think. um the hold fast yeah it could be the hold fast I reckon the holding yeah that's probably where they were taken and it's a prelude for for you Ben because obviously this is just before before you joined if you joined two thousand one mm. uh, around Revenge is Slow which was the debut of the the four piece lineup with as you've talked about Fletch moving your guitar. So Ben, how like how much of a fan were you when you joined? Oh, uh, pretty big. Like I would. Uh, what are the touch points? I'd buy everything that came out, every CD single, and I'd see them every time I was living in Wollongong. So it's definitely see them every time I'm in Wollongong. I'd often go to Sydney to see them. But I don't know. For me, it was like big, heavy stuff, and Blue Little Kiss were kind of the the bands I was obsessed about when I was when I was that age. Was there much of a, a language and, and pre-established dynamic between Jamie and, and Fletch and Richo, which, which you had to learn? Yeah, I guess I, I remember feeling quite, um, as I am still, but then I was, I was quite quiet and um, awkward and not very socially skilled. And I remember kind of the first few rehearsals. The, the first, I remember the audition pretty well. I remember the first few rehearsals after I joined and it was... I was. I w it felt like I was joining this little team, and I, I was. I was quite starstruck. I remember having a. I think I was having a pit out with you once across the road in Redfern from Troy Horse, and just going, just kind of thinking, I'm having. I'm eating a pit out for dinner with Jamie. <laughs> the luckiest guy in the world. <laughs> so I was I'm probably more. Start, and then, but then what? Then what I remember was the approach because I've been playing in bands and playing music forever, but this kind of this not just one level up, but a couple of levels up of. Um, rehearsing so hard and, and going back I just think oh that felt pretty good to me and Dave's like no sit back behind the beat there's got to be and we play it in a way that's like I can't really tell any difference there was a, such a not a pedantry but like a finesse to the approach of the music so I, was, I felt like I was learning a lot then because the, these three guys are just it felt like they were at the top of their game you know looking back now it, for me they may as well have been the Foo Fighters or something but you know you just patient wasn't exactly 
the colour and the shape. <laughs> Commercial. <laughs> <Hope not>. Commercial. <laughs> yeah, but that's funny you say. I think there's like, yeah, I think um, Fletcher and I had a um, certain language. Like, I think mm. it's a very much, Fletcher and I's relationship was based on music and humour. A lot of the rest of it between us was kind of awkward, but but music and, and, and the way that we uh, banter, we just have a kind of thing with our, with, with our humour. And even when Richo joined, I think he felt a bit outside of it because our mm. humour was quite, we don't mean it to be, but it was pretty mean, kind of, kind of mean, bone dry sort of humour. That's just the way that we would be. We'd be pretty brutal with each other and with other people, not being malicious, but it was just the way that we would entertain ourselves. And I know when Richo joined, I think he was a bit like, and it took him a while to kind of, yeah, I think there's just a sort of language or a culture that bands form, and especially if there's core members that have been doing stuff for years, there's a culture that exists, and it takes a while to... You don't want to make people feel uncomfortable, but it takes a while for people to kind of come inside the little little bubble and kind of go, oh, OK, it's safe, it's OK, you know. I was desperate to fit in, and not fit in, but impress, especially music. I didn't want to be... I didn't want to not fit in musically, but also, I guess, I remember seeing you at Wollongong Unibar once, and you were packing up at the end of the show, lugging gear out, and I was like, oh, I, should, I should go say it. Oh. And I think when you know a band from their music, angsty, moody, dissonant, mm. and you see them on stage and they're just, like it's, it's, a, it's a very limited amount of information to form a personal opinion on. Certain mythology kind of. Yeah, kind of that's sp- right, yeah. I, was, I remember kind of being surprised, like, oh, Jamie's actually pretty nice and cruisy, like. That's not what his music sounds like. It's not what he looks like on stage, but in person, yeah, it's quite easy to get along with. It's a pretty classic Jamie photo. <laughs> I just master slung, slung just so. And there's also like, I've got, I don't know if it's, if it's sweat or whether I've spilt something on my shirt. <laughs> a bit of both, probably. This photo here is like, there seems to be a million photos of Fletch and I in this, in this sort of stance. Mm-hmm, stance. Mm-hmm. It's like just some sort of... When I see Neil Young play now, you know how he moves with a guitar? He kind of mm. does this funny bob. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you've got it. It's nothing like that. You've, yeah. got a, you've got a thing with a guitar where you're kind of bound the back foot and wrangling it, and it's way better than what Neil <laughs> Young does. So you are talking before about the uh, process of getting re, re, re-greased, re-oiled, getting, getting the joints working, and particularly for Rich Show, right? What about you, Ben? Did you have to sit down and have a long conversation with your bass, or were you still playing... Uh, I hadn't really played bass for ages. I bought one of the little, new little things where you just plug your bass in and it goes into your headphones and you select what model, something or other. And I didn't like, like I think I was saying earlier, I didn't actually, I don't like playing things over and over. I'd rather, when I'm recording, I'd rather get something a bit imperfect, but I was feeling it at the time. So I went, I went through and made sure I could remember. With bass, I think bass is kind of easy. For me, as long as I know what note it starts on, the songs are imprinted into my brain forevermore so as long as I kind of remember where the where it started I'd, I'd be right yeah he's a super you're a super intuitive player so it's not a late doesn't ever seems laborious for you mm. what about for you Jamie there's a obviously you've can you've been you've never stopped making music yeah and you've been doing work with bands like infinity broke and you've done work with the tall grass but there's something particularly raucous and intense, particularly about the vocals in some of these Blue Bottle songs. Was there a kind of a reconfiguration for you as well? No, not really. I just had to kind of just... I mean, uh, when we started talking about it, a lot of the songs were lost, like the tunings and stuff I didn't have anymore. So I had to do a fair bit of deep diving, even going onto YouTube and watching Blue Bottle Kiss live footage and looking at my looking at my the shapes you know trying to press pause and look and you know these pixelated sort of old trying to work out what i was doing so there's a bit of that but actually once once i worked it out it was so it was it was okay so i still play some of the songs uh solo um so yeah and i mean infinity broke's pretty uh, the, yeah i guess there's these different sort of approaches when, when I'm when I'm doing whatever I'm doing, like sometimes with the solo stuff, I do more lower register singing and nylon string guitar, and which I really enjoy. But then with Infinity Broke, a lot of the time I'm kind of kind of singing at the top of my range. I remember you saying you'd yeah. um, discovering your young man's falsetto wasn't what it used to be. Oh, that yeah, I've never been very good with my falsetto. I'm always like Fletcher, whatever you do, 
make sure you double this when I, because you know because yeah my my falsetto has always never been great and if I'm singing I've always had a, a in terms of a screaming voice people would be like does that hurt your voice like no it's nice it's like the more I do it the more it just becomes this shredded thing and it's like yeah it's just sort of whatever it is it just sort of is out there but it's more finessed stuff like yeah falsetto singing and things like that like oh that's yeah my voice it's like I don't know what's going to come out I don't know It'll, you know, sound like a sparrow being dissected or something. You know, <laughs> you just don't know. so yeah, that's the great thing of having a, a really great um, second singer in the band. Um, Fletcher's sort of whatever, whatever Fletcher sort of yells into a microphone always is gold. You know, so it's like it's a really great foil. Um, but yeah, I mean, I didn't find it difficult or felt very natural. Fletch seems to be gifted with a kind of voice where it seems like it'd actually be hard for him to try and sing a wrong note. Yeah, 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 yeah. And there's and there's a quote that you I can't remember who you were quoting, Jamie, but you referred to a producer. I think it was a producer who at one point told you, "You're not really a singer, are you? You're more of a stylist." <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that was a guy that re- who is remixing. Um, his name was Jeremy Allen, I think. We'd done the album with Jack and Dino, Fear of Girls, and then the label wanted to remix Helping You Hate Me, and they, this guy, Jeremy Allen, he'd worked with some big trip-hop sort of people. I can't remember who, Massive Attack or someone like that, and he'd moved to Australia. He was this sort of British guy that just chain-smoked joints the whole time, and he, and he, and he, re, and he remixed that song, and he was, like, looking at the vocals, and that's what he... Yeah, I remember him saying that. Well, you're not really a singer. You're more of a stylist, aren't you? Okay, yeah. Yep, you're right. <laughs> You've been called worse. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I know this is going to be a pretty esoteric and nerdy sort of question, but let's see what happens. I've always been curious about how sometimes in Australian music there can be a, a leaning away from American accenting and use of Aussie pronunciation and sometimes a very deliberate Americanization. Now, I've heard both in, in Blue Bottle moments where the R's are definitely Yankified and other moments where it doesn't happen. And I just wondered, was there something conscious about that? Like as an Australian songwriter, Jamie, how do you decide or if you decide at all those things? Yeah, I think um, earlier, earlier on you're definitely um, very affected by your record collection and you like the way something sounds and you probably unconsciously are emulating it. Um, so I think some of the early records, I was unconsciously doing that. Um, and then just as I naturally found my own voice, I probably did it less. I think it's as simple as that. But I will say also that I do think that there, when it comes to singing, there's sort of a universal language that exists in rock and roll and people can get pedantic about accents and so forth. But if I listen to someone like Van Morrison, who's like, to me, one of my favorite singers of all time, he does not sound Irish when he's singing, you know? He's clearly listened to a lot of black music and a lot of blues and a lot of soul. And you would say he's, there's, a, there's sort of a, because of his, his love, his deep love of, of American roots music, you can hear that in the way that he sings, but it's not disingenuous in any way. Like it really, if, affects you you know that guy is a very uncompromising artist and you know people like Chris Bailey from the Saints I'd be like what you know like one of the greatest Australian punk rock singers of all time and it's like what country does this guy come from there's sort of a neutral there's just an attitude to the way that he sings that it's its own language so um, these days, I guess, with Doll Wave and all that sort of stuff, it almost feels occasionally almost like a caricature of an Australian sort of accent. Because I never really liked American, there was that American sort of that era in the 90s where a lot of American indie bands sounded like Kermit the Frog, you know, they these really weedy American kind of accents, which is sort of, again, the same sort of thing. It's like, I don't know, to me, I kind of like the neutral kind of thing where it transcends any any kind of country. It's just like it's coming from somewhere else, and it's like it's it's its own it's its own language. So it might go this way, it might go that way, you know. But but yeah, so it's a bit of it's a bit of both. There's there's an element where it's just a neutral thing, and there's times I think when I was younger where I probably was listening to too many American rock bands or something. I think that kind of changed as time went on. Um, I feel like, you know, like people 
often people feel like a person's first records are their best like but I think with my strong writing I think I I came into myself more and more as I got older I think as the records have kept going my like I found my own personal language with music more as a songwriter as time's gone on gone on there's the obligatory new Blue, Blue Bottle Kiss album question which could come to mind, but I want to tackle that subject a little bit differently by asking, Jamie, I mentioned there's been a fair bit of creative evolution for you as a songwriter since the departure from Blue Bottle Kiss, and I wonder, is Blue Bottle still a place that you can occupy creatively? Uh, I There was a time in my life where I just couldn't imagine Blue Bottle Kiss not existing. It kind of seemed to be the place where all my musical ideas would go. But since it stopped, I didn't, I, you know, I just could never imagine it stopping. It was like a relationship. But since it stopped, which is a long time ago, I think personally I've found different ways of doing things. I quite like doing different, different projects. So, yeah, I still have a lot of affection for the music. I think getting back together with the, with, with the guys are kind of... Um, yeah, I really realised how much I enjoyed enjoyed the music, but I don't I don't sort of look back and pour over the records and think about it that much. I I, I would say I, by nature, am fair, fairly at least with music, I'm fairly forward forward thinking. It's like that's what keeps me engaged is um, creating new work. Like I don't think I could ever exist as a musician um, playing. If I'd been in a band that was really successful, just sort of playing older hits and not really doing new material, for me, like working on new stuff is always what's most exciting. But um, I think Jamie's songwriting has some key touch points that recur and and maybe like some of the more experimental stuff is pushing on that. But I listen to some of Jamie's solo stuff and Infinity Broke and think, yeah, that could totally be a Blue Bottle Kiss song. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah, there's a song Infinity Broke with doing and Ruben was like this sounds a bit like Blue Bottle Kiss I'm like yeah it's funny that <laughs> you can't kind of get away from get away from that in, in a songwriting sense to me it would be easy in the next I, I have no doubt whatsoever in the next two years of songwriting Jamie couldn't write a Blue Bottle Kiss record I think in a practical where we're all at life sense getting together to rehearse and learn new songs and make an album just seems life doesn't seem to have that much luxury of time in it does it it's just yeah, and it sort of felt like I don't know. I felt like we, we, we said some, we said some pretty cool things over that period. You know, like over the six al- six albums. You know. Well, and I think, like I haven't made six solo records and four band records, or whatever you've done since. Mm. So it's easy for me and fans to think, oh, I want more Blue Bottle Kiss. But Jamie's moved on. He's got he's got plenty of output. He's got plenty of projects. I think. You feel the pressure sometimes that oh, let's do more Blue Bottle Kiss, and you're like, I'm, mm. I'm, that's the past. Yeah, and also I, 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 I've watched so many bands that reform and they have a really good time of it on their first tour, mm-hmm. and then they're like, mm-hmm. oh, look how many people have come out and seen us, and then and I and I think they kind of jinx it because they're sort of like, let's keep doing this and let's put out something new, and then slowly the audience is sort of dive bomb. That happens all the time with a lot, with a lot of Australian bands. I've seen that and. Um, yeah, I mean, there's that scarcity thing, you ja- know. Jamie's always, one of Jamie's favourite sayings, I reckon, one of the most sayings you've said most since I've known you is, leave them wanting more. <laughs> and it's true, though. Like, it's yeah. so easy to think, oh, do, do more, you know. Mm-hmm. Jam for another 10 minutes, do another three up. But actually, yeah. that scarcity is, is important. Like, if we made another 10 albums as Blue Bottle, it, it wouldn't be the same thing. Yeah. This, you, and you realise even with the blue, those Blue Bottle shows, there's a hardcore crowd that just love it you know and they would be involved in blue bottle and then possibly my other mm-hmm. projects as well and there's a peripheral crowd and there's no judgment on them at all about that but where there's a very strong nostalgic element you know there's other reasons there there besides the music and they're not going to keep coming back you know and that's that's fine but i think yeah in terms of a practice you can't delude yourself into thinking that 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 is that sustainable but you know it was great it was great fun and we'll do we'll do stuff again at some stage what is a blue bottle kiss <laughs> uh well if you 
people like Jamie or I grew up on the coast surfing. It's on the east coast of Australia at some point with the northeasterlies. You're going to get a blue bottle, uh, sometimes called a man of war, jellyfish type of thing with a long blue tail. And they really hurt when they sting, when they you get it wrapped around you. And especially the first time. Especially the first time. So you get one of those on the uh, on the old schmacker. Yeah. It's the kind of kiss you don't want. Yeah. But also, uh, uh, the time I was trying to work out a band name, I I was walking along. I'd been surfing at this place up the coast, and I was walking along. And there were some blue bottles on the beach and some kids had chucked sand on them and then written on the top blue bottle graves. And I thought that was I quite I before. thought that was quite imaginative. I remember thinking, Oh, that's really cool. And at the same time the Jesus and Mary chain had an album of B sides called Barbed Wire Kisses. And I come of thinking, yeah, that image of barbed wire and kisses and then the blue bottle graves are kind of they, they had this little I guess it must have been a little mini light bulb moment. So and I think it describes the music pretty well, that sweet and sour sort of thing. Last question, and that's to complete this phrase question. The sound of Blue Bottle Kiss is... It's the hardest question of all. I think it's the, again, the band name is a pretty good description of, this, of the sound. It's, there's some contradictory kind of elements like dissonance and harmony together. Um, joy and sadness together. I think there's, it's, it, the band has got that element of sort of opposing forces sort of converging. I don't know if I can add anything to that without sounding ridiculous. Something about, it's, it's, the, it's always been such a hard question. And everyone, the, the people at, you know, office work or something, oh, so what do you sound like? What kind of, what kind of music do you play? I've never really known how to answer the question. And it's not like it's just power chord, punky, grunge. You know, it's it's diverse, it's sweet, it's soft, it's incredibly aggressive and dissonant at times. Sorry, it's a terrible answer. I think what a beautiful, satisfying thing to be part of something creative that is indescribable because there's so much out there that you can sum up in two sentences. And this, you know, I would imagine that's such, such a such a wonderful thing to not be able to describe it. Yeah, well, it's funny when you have people that will go, they find out you play music, yeah, they're like, oh, so what sort of music you play? It's like, I'm always like, oh, you know, sometimes I play rock music, sometimes it's folk music or whatever. And whenever I say it, I'm like, I don't even want to answer this because I know the answer I'm giving is so perfunctory and doesn't, I do value what's what I'm involved with more than the way I'm describing it, but it's like you can't, yeah, you can't really, and they don't really want to know anyway. They're sort of just being polite, so you're not going to go, oh well, imagine, you know. You... Maybe there's something about there's something in there about art that you can only know by experiencing it. Mm. That's, that's a good a, quote. That's a great answer. Yeah. Well, I think we're good. Great. Yeah. Thanks. It's quite a, um, not a luxury or a privilege, it's quite, indul- not, maybe not even indulgent. It's, it's amazing. I th- I've often thought, ah, oh, you know, I, I don't know what half of Jamie's songs are about. The ones I've played yeah, night I. after night and sung <laughs> the lyrics to. And, and you don't actually talk about it that look, we don't, it's not like you sit down on a tour bus and go, now tell me what you wrote here, where you feel. You never talk about this stuff. You never talk, you're just in it. You're, not, you're yeah, on it, exactly. but you're not talking about it. Couple of times. Yeah. So once at the big day out and once at the Rod Labour room, I think. Okay. Yeah. So we went and saw Neil Young and Crazy Horse up at the Hunter Valley. It must be ten years ago. I reckon it might be the yeah. same time I saw in Melbourne. Yeah, it was around that psychedelic pill. Yeah. Um, really good. Mm. Funny though, whenever those Neil Young and Crazy Horse shows were on, 
the audience can knit this half the audience is always like what's this <laughs> like, this guy's been doing this for yeah. like 50 years but like